Start. Hey, it's Lemon. Welcome to the Backlogs. It's been a long time since we last stepped foot in the lands of Drain Lake, so I figured we were due for a return. And what better way to answer the age-old question that has been bouncing around in my head since yesterday? Can you beat Dark Souls 2 with only crossbows? While I get my due to the character creation station, let's go over the rules. First, the only direct damage we are allowed to do is with crossbows and crossbow bolts. Simple enough. Second, no cheating or exploits. And third, we have to beat every boss in the game before completing the game itself. After choosing a name that felt appropriate, I make my character a knight. Because much like Dark Souls 1, crossbows don't have scaling. So a class that starts with high health and stamina is the way to go. I sprint my way through the tutorial area and into Majula, and after getting my first Estus Flask from the Emerald Herald, I speedwalk my way through the forest. There were a couple close calls, but with the power of pure, unadulterated speed, I'm able to make my way through the level without fighting anyone. And after a hard left at Pate and a short ladder climb later, I finally have access to my first crossbow. Alright, let's get this run started. For those unaware, crossbows in Dark Souls 2 are a bit better than the first game. You can now have two bolt types available on the fly, and you can even manually aim the weapon if you're two-handing it. Oh god, that's jarring. We, uh, we won't be using that much. With a little bit of looting, I'm able to find enough souls to pop for the blacksmith key, who, after berating me for not being his daughter, is willing to sell me some crossbow bolts. They're bad, but it's better than nothing. Pew! Yep, still got it. Alright, let's see how bad the damage is this go around. 150? Damn, Dark Souls, alright, I see you. I make a few quick stops around the map, grabbing some loose titanite pieces, as well as a few Estus Flash shards, and before you know it, we've got a light crossbow plus three. The damage increases aren't going to be anywhere near as impactful as they would have been with a scaling weapon, but at least the base damage is still pretty significant. After picking up the last few odds and ends around the map, it's time to see what this baby can do. Wish me luck. First up is the last giant. <laughs> did, did you see what I did there? I know it's low-hanging fruit and all, but still, a guy's gotta eat. Okay, calm down, it was just a joke. The fight itself is as easy as you'd expect, but a great example of how the crossbow mechanics are going to impact the way we play. First off, the range on the crossbow is huge. We could be all the way across the arena and never see a change in the damage, so that's great. As for the attack speed, it leaves a lot to be desired. Much like Dark Souls 1, the crossbow automatically reloads after every shot, meaning we need to time our attacks in such a way that we don't get smacked around after every pull of the trigger. And lastly, the damage itself. As long as you've got the stamina for each pull, you'll do maximum damage. Try to shoot without the required amount though, and you'll do less. Weird, but okay. One boss down by the way. 31 more to go. I upgrade my crossbow to a plus four, then spend the rest of the boss souls on my armor. Because I want it. You get to buy something? No, Mauvelin. No, I did not. In fact, I bought something just for you. Uh, man, he's taking these bolts like a fucking champ. Shame he got stuck in the doorway. Right, let's get going. Next on the hit list is the Pursuer. How hard can he be? Oh. While his moveset isn't anything too difficult, some of his animations are a bit faster than the Giants. Good practice when it comes to getting my attack timings right. He was also an unwelcome reminder that adaptability is a thing in Dark Souls 2, and that I haven't put a single point into it. I might be misremembering, but I believe adaptability affects a lot of animation speeds, not just your iframes. Come on, man, drink it like you mean it. Took a little longer than I would've liked, but after a five minute endurance fight, the Pursuer finally goes down and gives me a ring of blades, which should give my crossbow a flat damage boost. Exciting stuff. Let's see, a few extra points here, a few levels over there, and there we go. Looking good. Moving right along, we've got two bosses to deal with over in Hyde's Tower of Flame. Dragon Rider's up first. In the interest of moving quickly and keeping things exciting, I didn't bother fighting any of the Armor Guardians, which means we're fighting on some very limited space. But considering our adaptability is at a much more appropriate level, this boss might as well just give me his souls now. Why does everyone even bother with the platforms? It's not like this fight is even... Eh, I'll fix it in post. There we are. Seamless. Can't even tell. Good job, Lemon. Just don't forget to take out the embarrassing death. We, we can't have people realizing you're terrible at Dark Souls. A few more points in adaptability. No, don't ask why. Upgrade the crossbow to plus six. And a quick and easy dragon fight. You know, typical Thursday. No, wait, poor hitboxes means it's Monday. Maybe? Where am I? Regardless, we finally slay a dragon, then take on a dragon slayer. Okay, that damage isn't too terrible. Maybe we can... It takes a few minutes to figure out the safest times to attack, but eventually Ornstein 2.0's attack patterns start to make sense. And after a few more minutes of running and shooting, the old Dragon Slayer goes down, giving me a goodly amount of souls and the old Leo Ring, which is going to be a staple in this run. 
Because believe it or not, the ring actually works with crossbow bolts, adding a whole new layer of complication to finding the right time to attack enemies. Hooray! After some careful consideration, I decided it was time to get a second crossbow. And with a little bit more stat building, voila! Dual wielded crossbows. This is the only Dark Souls game where dual wielding is a thing, and we'd be a fool if we didn't at least try it out. Dark Souls game. Dark. Souls. Go back and delete your comment. Elden Ring doesn't count. To be safe, I did do a quick test to check that the damage is increased when you dual wield. And it is. But there are a few other aspects to dual wielding that I didn't consider at the time. Turns out that dual wielding, while it increases your damage, also increases the stamina cost and reload time. So all that excitement about doubling my damage? Not always the best solution. Not by a long shot. At the current point in the run, it won't really have any negative impact on anything. Dual wielding still works great against regular mobs, and can really speed up the run. But against bosses, the extra stamina costs and extra reload time can make or break a fight. And the choice between extra damage or additional safety is an important one in later boss fights where there's fewer and fewer windows of opportunity to strike. Thankfully, the Flexile Sentry isn't one of those fights, and goes down with relative ease. But yeah, gonna be a problem later. And wouldn't you know it, later has arrived! The Ruined Sentinels were the first great example of this. Lots of damage to be had, but there's no way to get out of the reload animation in time. That said, this fight gives you the high ground, so there's still plenty of time to get in loads of damage. But once you have to give up that advantage, that reload time is gonna hurt. A lot. It took a few tries, but eventually I started to get the timing down. And after remembering that overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer, the Ruined Sentinels go down. That, uh, that sucked. But after a small investment into endurance, I can almost wear my elite knight armor. And more importantly, that extra defense really helps mitigate all the small mistakes I keep making when it comes to timing my shots. Next up is the Belfry Gargoyles. Much like the Ruined Sentinels, the biggest issue this boss fight presents is multiple enemies. Keeping my distance from one? No problem. Remembering to keep the other two just as far away? A little bit more difficult. It takes some patience, and a little planning, but the several hours I've already put into this run are really starting to show. He's starting to believe! And there we are. Gargoyles first try, let's go. I pump up my endurance enough so that I can wear all of my armor, have a little fun in the Bastille shooting gallery, then make my way on down to the Lost Center. Fighting a boss with ranged weapons in the dark? Eh, how hard can it be? Um, Lemon? You're, Lemon, you're not supposed to do well at this part. Come on, man, you're ruining the joke. It says in the script you're supposed to die multiple times. Really? So, so we're just going off script now? Fine, fuck it. Lost Center first try. Why not? Kidding aside, this run is really starting to feel easier and easier. The damage numbers aren't getting any better. Not really. But switching between firing modes and dodging around enemies is becoming an easier rhythm to find. I'm not sure if I should be worried about that or not, if I'm being honest. Cannot use. Oh, hey man, what's up? You hungry? I was just about to light up some s'mores. Yeah, sure, any seat you like. Up next is the Executioner's Chariot, and the multiple Tonys that guard him. This should be interesting. Be free, my meat bag! God damn it! As with earlier fights, the biggest issue this fight has is its multiple enemies. But if we take out the summoners, and then let the chariot take out the rest, we can make this fight much easier. You know what? We've got time. Let's try something I've never done before. With careful positioning and aiming, I can actually hit the chariot with little to no risk. In fact, with even better positioning and aiming, I can hit him twice in one pass. And after a few passes, we get the unique animation of the horse being stuck on the ledge. And Dark Souls, why do you always have to make me feel bad about the things I do? Good night, sweet prince. May you find rest down there in the dark. All right, moving on. It's time to enter the bone zone. This is probably not gonna go well. All right, well, maybe it's not all that bad, but it's still, well, tedious. I guess the word is tedious. Between the large number of enemies on screen, the fact that a good number of them have shields, and the problem of them being somewhat resistant to damage, this fight is easy, but goes on for far too long. We need a damage upgrade. How about a shield crossbow? I mean, it looks badass, no question about that. But as far as damage goes, it's not exactly an improvement. And while upgrading it does boost the damage significantly, it requires petrified dragon bones to upgrade it, which I'm not exactly rolling in right now. Ah well, maybe later. After picking up all the goodies in a few poison pits, and dying a few more times than I care to admit, I enter the earthen peak, where, if memory serves, I can find a heavy crossbow plus three. Very nice. I'll need a few more souls before I can use it and upgrade it, so let's give the covetous demon a run for its money, shall we? I tried to be clever and free some of the covetous' snack food, but apparently crossbow bolts aren't strong enough to break pots. So yeah, I guess we'll just have to murder him the boring way. As a proof of concept, I did do a little testing while I was here. Dual light crossbows give me 292 damage, while the heavy crossbow, at plus 3, gives me 249. Yup, this is the way. 
What the hell? I've never seen that animation before. Learning all sorts of new things today. But with little to no effort, Covetous goes down. Let's go upgrade our crossbow some more, shall we? Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. More damage and a slightly faster reload time make Lemon a happy camper. And also make for much easier boss fights. Mytha is normally a bit of a challenge due to her longer range and decently quick attacks. But with my newly upgraded heavy crossbow, there's nothing she can really do but die a slow, painful death. I mean, I guess she was already doing that, but with the constantly ingesting poison to try and stay beautiful or whatever, but if you really think about- Oh hi, hello! Ugh, we bland. This place always sucks. Doesn't matter what build you use. I poke Armorer Dennis to death, die, poke Fencer Sharon too, then die again. This, uh, this, this may take a while. Eventually, after a high intensity game of cat and mouse that's far too exciting to show on YouTube, I begin my fight with the Smelter Demon. It's a slow fight, due to the fact that my damage is much less than I would hope, and with the Smelter Demon's constant attack combos, stamina management is key to making sure you don't get obliterated. But with a little patience, and a lot of caution, Smelter Demon eventually falls to my bolts. A quick stop back into the Smelter Demon's arena to fight the Pursuer again, it goes well, but we get the Ring of Blades plus one for our troubles, so that's helpful. And after a few slightly frustrating deaths, we make it through Lava World and pull the switch. Gonna need you for later. Anyway, time for the old Iron King, who is neither old, iron, or a king. Because fuck you, that's why. I'll be honest, this fight was underwhelming. Dodge the fists, pull the trigger. Dodge the flames, pull the trigger. Hide around the corner, pull the, you see where I'm going with this. And with that, that's another great soul embraced. Easy peasy. You know, one thing I do miss about Dark Souls 2 is how many souls you get. I'm already level 94 and we've only crossed two big names off our list. Guess we better get a move on. This video's long enough as it is. Charlie, how's the kids? I ground out one of the Basilisks for some upgrade stones. Yeah, that's the one. Then infused my heavy crossbow with raw power. Okay, it's only an additional 20 or 30 damage, but come on, a man can dream. Clorinthy ring plus one, because why not? Help out the bird who lives just down the road. And on to Nachka. Ma'am, are you all right? You appear to have fallen and can't seem to get up. Nachka is nothing to write home about. She's slow and easy to dodge, and just for fun, I even knocked off her tail. So that's cool, I guess. Two out of 10, would not bother helping up again. After the local villagers hold a parade in my honor, it's time for the prowling Magoo and his congregation. It goes about the way you'd expect. Magoo himself takes about six crossbow bolts, and the rest of his congregation are one shots. So that was a boss. What the, who the hell are you? Oh man, Guthrie. Are you dual wielding Avalons? Oh, you best give me that as a drop or I'm gonna be so mad. Damn it! Anyway, continuing right down the road, I make it to the bird's workshop. She's got fire bolts, which I'll gladly take, and also sells heavy crossbows in case I ever want to dual wield them, which I do. But before we can really dual wield that properly, I need a few more souls, and I know just who to get them from. Combined with my new fire bolts, I'm able to kill Freya's children in one hit. And if we- Wait, no, stop, I'm sorry! As anyone who's fought Freya knows, the easiest way to beat her is to run back and forth between the heads. Repeat ad nauseum, and bam. Frey goes down. What the? Hey, hey you, who said you could wear my outfit? I wear it better. And don't you forget it. Oh, and I can do wheel heavy crossbows now. They're not perfect yet. I think one is a plus nine and the other's a plus six or so. But hey, one step closer to perfection. Bowman Guthrie made another appearance as well. I made sure to equip my gold serpent ring before killing him, just in case. There we go. Come on, come on, come on. Damn it! Moving right along, let's go after the Royal Rat Authority. This fight sucks no matter how you run it, but I will say that having a crossbow that can one-shot the adds before they reach me is definitely helpful. The authority itself isn't too bad. Firebolts do plenty of damage, and so long as we keep avoiding the paws, it should be. Much like Sif and her thigh gaps, the authority is a bit finicky with hitboxes as well. Thankfully, free aiming isn't very difficult this time around. And with a little bit of patience, ugly Sif goes down. Time for the pit. I pay Gilgan more than he's worth for a fancy ladder that we'll need later, Make my way down the pit as carefully and with as little clothing as possible, deal with an unwelcome visitor trying to flex on me with his invisible weapons, then begin my job in pest control. And let me tell you, business is booming. After a few hundred rat deaths, the Royal Rat Vanguard made an appearance. But it was rather brief and didn't really make a difference in the long run. Hey, where are y'all going? I'm still getting paid for this, right? Segue, 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 Black Gulch. After lighting a few oil fields on fire for fun, oh hey, that actually works. It's time for the rotten. This shouldn't take long. And you know what? It doesn't. With dual akimbo crossbows and firebolts, the rotten won't last long. And despite getting grabbed, which is usually a one-hit kill in my experience, 
I've actually pumped enough points into health and stamina that I can take the hit. I even take the time to take off the rotten's hand, because why not? And with a final pull of the trigger, the rotten goes down. Oh yeah, the hand drops an item. Pharos Lockstone. Wow, thanks Pharos. Hope you feel better. So with all the Lord's souls acquired, we can hoo! I upgrade my armor a bit for the challenges to come and make my way to Dranglick Castle. Jeeves's ghost may be a little confused, but he does have something I want. Magic and lightning bolts. I'll take a few of those, thank you. And after filling my imaginary backpack to the brim with bolts, it's time to fight the twin dragon riders. Neither of them have very much health, and if you focus fire on one of them, it becomes a pretty straightforward fight. Nothing to see here, at least nothing we haven't already seen before. You know, we're in a pretty good place at this point. Between our high damage and rounded out stat points, I doubt there's really anything that can give me any trouble. The Looking Glass Knight isn't too bad. The only two things that make this fight difficult are his shield and the friends he keeps inside it. It was a bit tricky trying to split my focus between them, since one was always quick to support the other, and even when I did take the time to kill his buddy, the Looking Glass Knight just summoned in another one almost immediately. Fine, you have my full attention. Are you happy now? It took some finagling, but with careful shots and deft dodging, the Glass Knight finally goes down. Oh boy, the Shrine of Amana! Can't wait to lose my souls here over and over again. Actually, maybe this won't be so bad. Wait, stop! I have a family! Yep, same old Amana. Never change. At the end of it all is Grandma Frog. She's fine. Just dodge the creepy mouth hands and fire whenever she stops moving. Easy enough, boss. Moving on! Into the Undead Crypt, where we... Really? Still doing this, huh? Despite a few frustrations with the crossbow moveset... Come on! Do the jump! I finally make my way to the secret wall deeper into the crypt, where my prize awaits. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, the Avalon is back. Let's just get that up to snuff, and give it the old raw power infusion. And there we go. Call of Duty mode unlocked. Better test it out, though. Gotta make sure this thing is worthy of the name. Let's see, about 113 damage per bolt with the Avalon, and 238 damage with the heavy crossbow. Yep, that all checks out. The Avalon has all the same problems that dual wheeling does. Heavy stamina costs, slow reload speed, and the inevitable deaths that come along with those properties. But if you adjust for those issues, you're still looking at a greater damage output than anything else. And in the long run, sometimes that extra damage is all that matters. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and finish that off right quick. There we are, plus 10. But you know what's better than a plus 10 raw Avalon? Two plus 10 raw Avalons. I talked to the Fates and asked them to give me enough strength and dexterity to dual wield some machine guns, use a bonfire aesthetic and fight the gargoyles again in order to get me a golden serpent ring plus two, then burn another bonfire aesthetic in the doors of Pharos. Why, you ask? Because if you send the doors of Pharos into New Game Plus, Omen Guthrie will respawn a total of 12 more times. Combine that with my Jester hat, Watch Dragon Parma, Golden Serpent Ring plus two, and handsome good looks, and there shouldn't be any reason why Guthrie doesn't drop another Avalon for me. God damn it! I won't bore you with the details of how many times I killed Guthrie. Suffice it to say, it was a lot. Honestly, I'm up to my ears in Royal Soldier's armors. I kind of wonder if they can even drop- <gasps> Come on, come on, come on, come on! All right! Time to test these puppies out. Oh, oh! Don't be fooled by the damage numbers on the bottom of the screen. That's the damage of each individual bolt. Definitely a bit too heavy for my liking at the moment. The weight of two Avalons and my Elite Knight armor is messing with my iframes. But at least the bosses are melting with extreme speed. So, you know, take what you can get. After fighting the same boss three more times in a row, I finally arrive at the Dragon Shrine. <sighs> okay. You know what? I'm feeling good about what I got going on here. I'm gonna do the Dragon Shrine the right way. Okay, not a great start, but we can still recover. Yeah, no, fuck that. Speedrun strats it is. All right, made it. You, uh, you all wanna go take five, or? After a quick message conversation with the dragon, we get the Ashen Mist Heart. But you and I both know how this ends. Slowly, painfully, and with a thousand or more crossbow bolts in between the ancient dragon's toes. Man, even the Avalons don't speed things up. Literally the worst. Time to phase into trees and search their memories. Because Dark Souls. Good lord, everything in here is a bit more angry than I remember. That thing stops, right? Time for the Giant Lord. He's really not that hard. Just hide on the ledge, dodge an attack, and respond in kind. Takes a few minutes, but we get there eventually. Thanks for the memories, Chief. All right, moment you've all been waiting for. It's time for the DLCs. There's still about five or so bosses left in the base game, but I think my build is at the point where it's really not gonna get any better. So might as well throw myself into the grinder now, eh? I make my way through the poison-drenched cityscape, get into an argument about fashion souls with Thomas over there. Hey, wait, no one said we could bring friends. And eventually, 
eventually remember where the heck I'm supposed to go. A few minutes of falling with abandon, and we'll be at the first boss of the DLC. How hard could she be? So, yeah, Alana, let's talk about this. We've got several things going against us in this fight. First off, the summons. If it were a one-on-one -on -one fight, this boss would be easy, but Alana loves to summon in friends, which means you have to split your focus between two or more enemies, all of whom hit really hard or cause status effects. So that's a good time. Second is these damn fireballs. Video game developers, please take notes. If you're gonna design an explosion, make it very, very clear where the explosion's range ends. And third is our damage output, plain and simple. It's too low. By the time we make some decent progress on her health bar, she's already summoning in her second round of friends, with no sign of slowing down. And speaking of slowing down, the crossbow's attack speed is problem number four. Low damage is one thing, but low damage and a low rate of attack is another entirely. Each attempt takes several minutes just to bring her to half health, which really starts to add up when you keep dying repeatedly. Things were getting pretty fucking dire. Even Tony over here is starting to laugh at me. <laughs> you fucking meatbag. So, I did the one thing left I could think of. I asked chat for help. With mixed results. So, who has ideas? <laughs> who has ideas? Because <laughs> I need some. We're stuck. Can you smuggle the ballista from the pursuer into the boss arena? That's an idea. I, I, I should specify. Does anyone have any good ideas? Can you attach fire bombs to your bolts? If I can, I don't know how. Or shoot her again? <laughs> That's that's an option. That's that's a, that's certainly an option. Try aiming for the head. Hmm. Man, she took that like a champ. <laughs> she didn't even she didn't even blink. Try using a sword. We, we no. I I don't. I think you're in the wrong chat. Can we try the shield crossbow, please? Sure. Why not? <laughs> I love this thing. It's so stupid. Pew. One seventy five. Not bad. But it is a full-on, ooh, and 197 when she's casting. That's good. Does it fire faster than everything else? Hold on. Hold on. Wait a goddamn minute. Hold on a minute. Plus the shield. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Hold on. Did we just... Did we just figure it out? Two and a half hour story cut short. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Turns out, the shield crossbow has several things going for it that I didn't account for. First off, the stamina use. Every shot with the shield crossbow is cheaper than other crossbows, except for maybe the light crossbow. Combined with the fact that it does almost as much as the heavy crossbow damage-wise, and with the stamina regen shield added into the mix, I can now attack more often and with no real loss in damage. Add in a free shield that blocks a portion of incoming damage, so long as you're firing a bolt, and you've got a pretty amazing crossbow. Sleeper hit of the summer. If you haven't tried it before, give it a go. Definitely worth it. Chat also helped me figure out a strategy for the summons as well. Apparently, Alana is pulling from a pool of summons. Three skeletons, her boy toy extraordinaire, and on a rare occasion, a sounder of swine. That means a group of pigs. That's right, you just learned something today. Useless knowledge aside, Chat helped me realize I was goofing up all my earlier attempts. In my first hundred tries, I would always wait for skeletons, then kill two of the three, thinking I was hot shit for outsmarting the system. However, if you don't kill the skeletons entirely, that means they aren't in the summoning pool anymore. Which means you're basically guaranteed to get Velstad. Which is less than ideal. Kill all the skeletons as fast as you can, though, and you'll put them back in the pool. And when all the kids are back in the pool, you've got that much more of a chance that they'll get summoned again. It's a shame you can't stop the summons entirely, but hey, we'll take what we can get. Oh, run away! Ah! <laughs> 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 oh, yeah! <laughs> oh, oh shit! It still takes forever and several tries, but eventually, with the power of friendship and copious amounts of capitalism, Alana goes down. Thanks again, chat. Couldn't have done it without you. So, with Alana out of the way, it's time for sin. How bad can it be?
<laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. Though Sin looks intimidating, he's really not that bad once you figure out his patterns. Sprinting away between his attacks is usually the easiest way to dodge all of his toxic fire, as is running towards him, rather than away. And while he is certainly aggressive, Sin's attacks are slow enough that you can get several shots in between them, if you're careful. It takes a few tries, but nowhere near as many as Alana, and eventually the beastie goes down. Next up is the gank squad. Not much to say here, if I'm being honest. I focused fire on Sarah for the beginning of the fight, so as to get rid of the ranged element, and shot at the other two gankers whenever there wasn't an opportunity. Did that just say five damage? And once Sarah went down, it became a matter of kiting the remainders around the map, getting in shots when I could. Down goes Alva, leaving us with just Havel. Oh, thank god he actually takes damage. Wait, Estus? You're trying to Estus? Not in my house you don't. Damn invaders, it's always something, isn't it? But with the gank squad out of the way, that's the poison DLC completed. Who's ready for round two? Getting through the DLC itself wasn't too much of an issue, but the bosses themselves were a whole other ballgame. First, I went after the blueberry flavored smelter demon. Honestly, it was basically just a replay of the first smelter demon fight. Dodge the swings, shoot when you're able. There were a few times where he caught me off guard. I can really move when he feels like it. But in the end, a reskin is just a reskin. Next up was the fume knight. I'll be honest, I was a bit worried about this one. But, truth be told, I really didn't need to be. He's slow and clunky for the first half of the fight, so getting in damage and heals is easy enough. And although he speeds up in phase two, he still has ample windows of opportunity if you're patient and time it right. After mastering his attack timings and learning the range of his attacks, Fume Knight goes down on the second try. Not bad. Not bad at all. Which leaves me with just one boss left. Sekiro. Uh, I mean Sir Alan. Alright, hold up. Can we just talk about the runs up to all these DLC bosses in this game? Like, why are they all so hard? For some reason, I wasn't able to lock in Sir Alan's attack patterns like I was with the other bosses. The knowledge that I would have to deal with all of his minions again every time I died must have weighed on my mind or something, because no matter how many times I tried, I just kept dying to his rush attacks. I know his attacks. I know what to do. I even know when to attack in response. So why the hell do I keep dying over and over again? This one needs to marinate a little longer. Let's come back to him later. Ah, Elium Lois. Somehow my favorite and least favorite DLC at the same time. First up was Ava. Aw, who's a good kitty? It's you. Yes, it- Oh, no! The biggest trick Ava really has up her sleeve is her delayed attacks, which took a little bit to get used to. But once you figure them out, she's just the sweetest little thing. Ava, no! Bad! Spit it out! Icky! You don't know where that's been? Spit it out! It took a few tries, but Ava goes down simple enough in the end. All right, we all knew this was coming. Time to take on the worst offender of any Dark Souls game ever made. The frigid fucking outskirts. Here's a cool concept. Let's make the player run blind in a snowstorm where they can only periodically see where they need to go. Great idea, but how do we make sure it keeps the spirit of Miyazaki's undying hatred towards his players? Well, that's simple. Just add motherfucking unicorns! Okay, whatever. They're not actually unicorns, but they're definitely a close cousin. Who thought a respawning pool of these stupid things was a good idea? Every attempt to get across the outskirts takes at least three to five minutes, too. That's a long time to waste just to get to one of the more frustrating bosses in the game. Oh, and don't worry. I fucking got there. Lud and Zalin were on my hit list after dealing with that area. I was even doing really well. All that practice against Ava must have paid off in spades because Lud's attacks were basically second nature to dodge. Add in a second cat though, and it's a different ball game entirely. Ever tried to balance dodging delayed attacks from two separate bosses and the intricate timing it takes to get a shot off from a crossbow? Well, I have. It sucks. There were even a few really good first attempts where I was able to focus fire on one cat, which made it even worse when I died. I even killed Lud at one point. Thought I had the whole fight in the bag. But, as with all cats, they always have a tendency to get out. I completely forgot about Zalin's charge-up ability, where it gets angrier and starts to regenerate health. That extra bit of frustration must have gotten to me, because I completely biffed it. Weirdly enough, it turns out the winning strategy was something I would have never suggested. Using the Avalon, and staying locked off instead of locked on. Don't ask me why, but for some reason it just felt easier to keep track of both of the cats and dodge attacks when I wasn't hyper-focused on one of them. And using the Avalon required me to find the right times to attack, instead of trying to get in and attack every chance I could, like I was before. Once it was just Zalin, I did go back to locking on and switching over to my heavy crossbow, more for the reliability than anything else. But after a much more successful buffing phase, Zalin eventually, finally, went down. This is why no one does Dark Souls 2 challenge runs game do better. But with the cats out of the way, it's time to go for the owner himself. Let's go boys, it's Ivory King time.
Why, why did nobody tell me we were doing a team superhero landing? Communication is important, Jerry. The team scrimmage isn't all that bad. The crossbow does decent enough damage, and with pretty much all of the enemies hyper-focusing on me for some reason, it gave my boys plenty of time to get a few hits in to help out. And before long, it was time. The burnt ivory king himself. Now, I knew this was going to be difficult. Not only because he's one of the harder hitting DLC bosses in the game, but also because he's by far the boss I have the least amount of experience with. I just don't know all of his attacks or his attack timings. Which means his buff up phase is basically just a countdown timer for my inevitable death. Yep, there it is. Right on schedule. God, every time. Literally every time. As soon as the sword becomes a lightsaber, that's it. My game is immediately thrown off. So, I did the only reasonable thing I could think of. I took a break. And weirdly enough, as it always does, the break helped. Dodging felt smoother. The timings felt natural. I was in the zone. Alright, maybe not entirely in the zone, but I had at least one foot in it. After all the frustrating DLC bosses I've been through, suddenly Alon just doesn't feel that threatening anymore. Time on the tool. That's all it took. And just like that, Sir Alon goes down. One more. One more DLC boss to go, and I can be free. Please, base god, just let me leave. I promise I'll be good. No more chocolate before bed, just please. Considering the difficulty of the Ivory King, I decided to let him marinate just a little bit longer, and went after the final optional bosses of the main game. First up was the Dark Lurker. Jeez, talk about underwhelming. After the bullshit I've been through, this boss is a cakewalk. Oh, you can split in two? Oh, that's nice. Delay all of your attacks and then we'll talk. I even got cocky enough to start using the Avalon. Easy peasy. Get good, scrub. I've got bigger fish to fry. Hey, Gramps, you're up. Give me a challenge, would you? Oh. Oh, no. Oh, he's easy. I mean, yeah, his health pool is bloated as all get out, but the man's only got like three attacks. This isn't hard. This is just tedious. And that's almost worse. Almost. Well, we're not getting any younger. Time to get to work. I make it through the team fight, this time with some additional help. I'm gonna name you Carl. And Carl's dead. Lemon, you know better than that. Never name them. It always hurts so much more when you name them. But, Carl's death aside, something feels... different. Not entirely different, mind you. Avery King still hits like a stack of bricks. But there's definitely something. One foot in the zone? Maybe. Maybe. Eventually, I realized that my best opportunity for attacking, without getting clapped back, was whenever the King does his jump attack. Which is pretty often, considering I'm using a ranged weapon. And while I'm still having some trouble with a few of the King's attacks... Oh, bullshit. It's not too much longer before it all comes together. Time for the final push. The King's Chambers. The final three bosses in the game. Let's do this. Let's be honest. In comparison to everything the DLC threw at us, these last few bosses might as well be trash mobs. I take my time with the Watcher and Defender, balancing my shots between them as best I can. And once the Watcher goes down, it's really not much of a fight after that, considering she was the one doing all the pushing. One down, two to go. The Chandra's up next. But as anyone who's made it this far knows, she's all bark and no bite. Because of our long-range capabilities, she's basically just a watered-down version of the Dark Lurker. Easy to dodge, and wildly unthreatening. Aside from her death laser going wonky every once in a while, there's nothing to write home about here. Which means we've only got one more boss to go. There he is, the Scholar of the First Sin. Once again, while his attacks are imposing and could definitely do some real damage if they hit, they, uh, they really don't. Who knows, maybe we'll even clear this triple threat all in one. Thank you, Dark Souls. Goof ups aside, he's as easy as the rest. One more final pull of the trigger, and that's it. Dark Souls 2 in its entirety, beaten with only a crossbow. Man, what a roller coaster. If you made it this far into the video, kudos to you. There were plenty of times where I was having fun, just enjoying the ebb and flow of attacking and dodging. The calm response of it all definitely seems to be my playstyle of choice for these games. But for a couple bosses there, things got pretty rough. I'll be honest, I had to put this run down a few times just to make sure I kept a level head throughout. But as with all things, it always seems impossible until it is done. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. This one took a lot of effort to put together, but I think it was worth it in the end. I'm hoping to get a few more larger runs like this one done for the future. Looking at you, Bloodborne. So feel free to do all the YouTube things if you're feeling spicy, or want to make sure you're alerted when that one finally comes out. And in case I haven't made it clear, a big thanks to all of you for watching my videos. Couldn't do what I do without you. Sometimes quite literally. So I just wanted everyone to know that the fact that you all give up a portion of your day to watch my nonsense or send me the moral support I need to break through any brick walls I come across in my challenge runs is greatly appreciated. And I can't thank you enough. But other than that, that's all I've got. Stay safe out there, be good to one another, and I'll see you all again soon.